overhead there with uh, Christopher Surov, who is IMD manager at VMware. And uh, now he's going to talk uh, to us about uh, one of his uh, favorite topics, game development. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, OK, let's get started. Well, uh, my name is uh, Hristo Klisurov. I'm a game and web developer. And these are some of the companies that you might know me from. And today we are going to be talking about open source game desktops. But actually, before we get started, uh, can anybody tell me what is a technology stack? Technology stack. Anyone? Go ahead. A collection of software uh, which uh, is used for a development in a certain field uh, from all the layers of development for, for example, for I don't know, for, for websites, this might include, say, I don't know, JavaScript, Node.js, or any other kind of server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much that's it. It's a collection of technologies that uh, uh, helps us to uh, address a specific problem. And the problem or the task that we have on our hands today is how do we build a game? Uh, Basically, modern AAA games are created by huge teams of hundreds of people with uh, studios across the world. And they have a bunch of different uh, types of professionals, ranging from producers through art directors, testers, artists, all sorts of guys. But uh, in, in essence, in its essence, uh, game development can be uh, driven by three main personas. And these are artists. These are basically the people that create the content that we see in the games. Uh, all the 3D models, the concept art, uh, the sounds, all the things that we experience uh, in games as uh, multimedia project. The designers are tightly connected to the artists, but these are the people that are uh, typically involved in uh, what is of, uh, often called world building. So they take the individual uh, um, assets and um, things produced by the artists and they combine it in game levels. They set up some basic logic or the game mechanics. So for example, if uh, you press this button, uh, the player is going to jump. And the third main persona is the developers. These are the people that provide the technology. They either develop the game engine or the main technology that drives the games or they uh, adapt uh, ones that are currently available. And they also supplement the game engines with uh, additional software, typically called middleware, which allows it to provide more, um, more things. And what we are going to do today is actually to see uh, uh, what open source um, uh, options do we have for each of these three main personas. And we'll basically build a stack of technologies that we can use to create any sort of game. Uh, we'll first start with the art section. Uh, this is pretty much made of visual tools that are used by the artists that we mentioned earlier. And first is 2D. Uh, GNU image processing uh, uh, manipulation program or simply GIMP uh, needs no introduction. It's, uh, by far the best uh, uh, raster image uh, manipulation software that's open source out there. It's an excellent alternative to Adobe Photoshop. And uh, in game development, you uh, use it either to create or draw uh, concept art, um, 2D art, all sorts of uh, assets that you might need. Uh, an honorable mention here is a um, software suite called Krita, which also is great for drawing. But GIMP is uh, overall, it's much better because it allows you to use its, uh, its uh, properties for another major task in 2D uh, raster uh, editing, which is actually to edit the textures or the skins of the 3D models that we have in the game. And 
Although GIMP nicely uh, covers 2D raster graphics, sometimes you might need vector graphics. For example, for uh, UI or for more of a flat-like um, uh, game experiences. And here you can actually use a uh, great software called Inkscape, which is basically a really great open source alternative to um, Adobe Illustrator. And so pretty much a quick recap. GIMP is for raster graphics. Inkscape is for uh, vector graphics. And to complete our 2D uh, package, uh, we need one more thing, which is basically animation software. Uh, sometimes you actually do the animations inside of the game engine itself. We'll see this uh, later on. And you have a visual timeline and um, keyframes over there that you can use for that. But sometimes artists are not that um, willing to use the game engine for animations. And um, in that regard, uh, you can actually use Zinfic uh, for 2D animations. And you can either create the animations there and export them as sprite sheets to be used in the game engine, or you can just create mockups to be re-implemented in the uh, game engine later on. Uh, from the commercial products, probably the, the closest uh, thing is Adobe Animate. It is called Flash for the last few years. And uh, we covered 2D with uh, GIMP, Inkscape, and Zinfic. So now let's move on to 3D. So what do you need for your, from your 3D altering environment? Anybody? What do you need 3D? Create models, models. Well, the answer is a lot. Uh, you need 3D altering environment first to model the actual models. So to define its geometry and shape. You also need uh, adequate means to design the proper materials and textures for the uh, created models. You also need it uh, to actually compose it with uh, other things and you might even need it to create uh, 3D cinematics for your game. So uh, short movies that uh, basically uh, um, enhance the gameplay. And probably most of you have seen it, but if you haven't, go and see Sinto. It's a great example of what Blender is possible, uh, what uh, Blender is capable of. It's a great short movie. It's already five or six years old, but it's still a great representation of uh, the capabilities of the 3D software. So, uh, moving on. Uh, to the sound department. Uh, it's a huge topic by itself, but in general there are two main things that you need uh, to make games and uh, to use sound in them. So first is actually to record. So you, you either record the actors that you use or uh, you use uh, Foley artists or you just record instruments. So in this uh, uh, step you uh, you use uh, Audacity. It's a great software and it's pretty much probably uh, the closest alternative to it in the commercial world would be uh, Adobe Audition and it's great to either record or to clear actually the sounds that you record. And the other major task that you have uh, in the sound department uh, in regards to games, uh, is actually to compose some music. So uh, you're not just recording existing uh, sounds, but you can basically compose new, uh, uh, new sounds and uh, add it to your game. So let's see how our uh, game dev stack is progressing. We already have the 2D covered with GIMP, Inkscape, and Zinfic. Uh, we have the 3D nicely covered with Blender. Uh, Blender, by the way, even has video editing capabilities, so it really covers a lot of ground. Even has raster and vector right? <laughs> yeah, let's not get into that. And used to have a game engine. Oh, yeah. Used to have, used to have, yeah. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, Why Blender... Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to happen anyway. But. Uh, 
uh, it's true that Blender even had a game engine option, but it, it never was uh, its main uh, focus. And we have the, uh, the sound card with Audacity, and actually, I didn't mention the name, but this OMMS, it's uh, kind of a quickie abbreviature, but uh, we have it covered. So uh, we, we have the, basically the artwork covered, and now we, we have to move on to the actual technology that uh, combines all the assets and all, all that into, into a game. And to be told, uh, game engines uh, uh, went a long way. Um, <coughs> some time ago, probably almost 20 years now, <laughs> when I first started uh, uh, getting my head around game development, uh, game engines were something that basically you couldn't get your hands on. Uh, they were very expensive. They, they had price tags like tens of thousands of dollars, and there was no way to get into a really nice game engine. And creating a game engine by yourself is a humongous task. Uh, it's, it involves a lot of coding, and you need a lot of uh, math, actually. It's one of the very few, actually, uh, software products that uh, need math in development. So, uh, it was very tough to get started in game development specifically for that purpose because it was very hard to get to a game engine. But this changed in the probably uh, mainly in the last 10 years. Uh, for some people, people uh, this was one engine for some other. But for me, it was actually Unity because it was the first engine that uh, basically allow you uh, to create games that look like something, and uh, it, it was, in essence, it, it was never open source, but uh, it, it was free, and a lot of people could get into game development through it. They, uh, they built up some skills, they understood the basic foundations of game development, such as game mechanics, uh, uh, the main loop, basic understanding of computer graphics, all the things that are necessary for you to become a game developer. And uh, Unity provided that and basically forced the rest of the commercial game engines to change. And first, uh, uh, Unreal Engine, back then three, uh, was changed and there was a free version of it called UDK. And um, after that, um, the pricing of the game engines uh, started to change a lot. And when uh, Unreal Engine 4 was released, it was uh, with subscription of just $20, which was something uh, uh, very revolutionary back then, because it was just $20 per month. And after that, they even removed that. And they made uh, the um, uh, source code of Unreal Engine 4 source available. But, <laughs> Does source available mean open source? What do you think? The same like Android. Well, it, it's, it's not the same. No, no, not in any way. So uh, that, this is actually the main problem. That uh, even though you can uh, see the, the source code of the uh, game engine to alter it for your specific needs, you, you cannot. Uh, it's not really open source. It's not free. You cannot uh, redistribute it, so it's not really that great. But uh, actually, there's not really a problem because in the last few years, there's a bunch of awesome game engines that are really free and open source, and we'll actually check that. Uh, Zenku is uh, one of the game engines that uh, was actually open source just a few months uh, ago. Uh, it, is, uh, it was originally developed by a Japanese company, Silicon Graphics, uh, and it has a lot of uh, modern features. Uh, it has support for modern uh, graphic APIs such as DirectX 12 and Vulkan, PBR materials, light probes. Uh, it has VR modes which are um, uh, very uh, nicely integrated with uh, 
HTC Vive and Oculus. So basically, you can develop uh, VR games and experiences with it and uh, use the common API for both for HTC and for Oculus, which is really nice. And it really feels like a, a premium uh, game engine. So it's a really great option. Uh, next, uh, we have probably the most famous one uh, in the last few years, uh, Godot, <coughs> or as some people say it, Godot. Uh, as far as I know, it comes from French, so it's something like Godot. And uh, the naming doesn't really matter, but it's really a great piece of uh, game development software because uh, it allows you to create both 2D and 3D games. So basically it has like two engines in itself would facilitate that. It has a very crazy uh, visual timeline for animations that they claim it's uh, animate anything. You can even animate function calls, which is a bit crazy. And um, it has visual scripting, which is something very nice because what we saw uh, earlier in the presentation is that Game designers um, actually define the game mechanics or, or what's going on in the game. But it's uh, hard for them to actually write the, the actual code that will uh, do this. And by using visual scripting systems, uh, uh, game uh, designers can actually script some basic interactivity with, without having to be programmers. And uh, visual scripting is uh, actually available in the commercial uh, game engines in um, Unreal Engine 4 is called uh, Bluepaints and um, uh, before that in UDK was uh, the Kismet uh, system and um, you have visual scripting also in CryEngine so it's something that's uh, typically available in uh, modern game engines but few uh, of the open source ones have it. So this is, uh, for me, a very important um, point about you know, Godot because it uh, allows you to build a nice um, uh, teamwork. You, you can basically have programmers focusing on profiling, on performance, on things that they care much about and leave game designers to actually design some of the basic um, uh, logic of the game. You still have to use uh, programming for things that are heavily performant, but uh, for basic things, visual scripting is uh, great with uh, game designers. Another uh, very important note about Godot is that it supports a lot of uh, different um, target platforms. So you can export it for um, or build it for desktop, for for major desktop uh, platforms, for web, which uses HTML5 and WebAssembly, which is really great. Um, you can build it for mobile, so a lot of options there, which basically means that you can um, use it for many different types of games. And it has a huge community, so uh, there are a lot of um, people that can help you if you have questions or uh, have some kind of uh, additional needs. Um, next, for, we have Phaser, which is a web-based uh, game engine. Basically, you create a game inside of your browser, and it's great in many regards in that uh, thing, because you can use JavaScript and TypeScript, so if you have front-end uh, development experience, it will be very natural for you. It has an online editor, so it doesn't. It, it means that you don't have to download, build, and all that uh, for, to, to get started with development. It, it has uh, uh, a very nice um, online sample library, and uh, it uses uh, both HTML canvas and WebGL. And they claim that they practically seamlessly switch between one and the other, depending on certain conditions, which is a bit. Oh, but uh, uh, it's HTML based, which is uh, nice because it runs directly in the browser. You can use it on desktop, you can use it on mobile. And actually, uh, there are a ton of other game engines that are open source. These are just some of them. And 
it, uh, it, it's really nice because each of them has its own community and they're pretty, pretty life as products. And what you might end up is that you're practically overwhelmed by the uh, uh, options that you have as a game engine uh, in open source uh, regards. <coughs> so how do you basically pick your engine? Well, um, it really depends on the hard limitations that you might have for your specific game that you have in uh, your mind. So, for example, if you want uh, modern graphic APIs like uh, Vulkan and Direct, DirectX 12, you'll go with Zenko because it's pretty much the only one that uh, has full support for that. Uh, or if it's something uh, like visual scripting that you need, uh, you go with uh, Godot. Or if you are, for example, a person that has uh, front-end experience, you might feel more natural in uh, uh, game engines that are more webby. And on the other hand, if you uh, are new to game development and you don't want to have a whole overhead of uh, learning uh, a new programming language or um, getting around uh, all the aspects of game development, you just want to build really simple games, you might go with uh, GDevelop, which is very uh, easy to learn and it has a very nice learning curve. And for example, if you want to do something very really crazy, you can uh, use uh, A-Frame to basically create VR experiences for web. So it, it really depends on the hard limitations that you put yourself uh, against. And another important note is that uh, the gaming uh, technology is not just driven by the community. Actually, the big companies are also helping. Uh, ID Software, which is uh, quite uh, known in the gaming world, uh, and they, they have uh, a great contribution to uh, very popular games such as Wolfenstein, Doom, uh, Quake. They have they pretty much open source all their old game engines. So uh, once any of their game engines becomes like four or five years old, they just open source it because they believe that. Uh, if it's uh, several years, they need to move on to uh, another level of uh, uh, game engine and they just open source the old one, which is great. Uh, Ubisoft, uh, creators of a popular series Assassin's Creed and uh, uh, Division and many others, uh, they have open sourced the uh, open source uh, this last year. It's called Sharp Make and it's an uh, alternative to pre make and C make. And basically, it's a solution for generating project definition files such as uh, Visual Studio projects, uh, Make files, Xcode projects, all that. And uh, they claim that uh, it actually, in some cases, uh, it takes like uh, 20 to 30 times uh, less time to generate the project files, which is great because if you're building a really build, uh, big game, uh, you actually have a huge repository and you, you don't want to uh, waste too much time into uh, waiting for uh, files with configuration to generate. Uh, EA games, uh, they're uh, Famous for mostly for their uh, uh, sports games and uh, uh, also for SimCity, and they have uh, actually open sourced EA WebKit, which basically is a fork of WebKit, which is used in Safari, and um, they use it as a user interface system, and um, they have open source, which is really nice. V8 uh, is the JavaScript engine that uh, Google Chrome actually uses. But the interesting perspective here is that you can use it as a scripting for your game. So you can integrate V8 in your game engine and basically 
create the scripting logic, the things that we talked about earlier, that uh, if you press this button, do this, in JavaScript, which is very nice if you are into web development. Agones is uh, actually um, an open source project by Google, Google Cloud specifically, which allows you to uh, actually create game uh, dedicated servers uh, you, uh, running on Kubernetes, which is also an interesting perspective. Uh, well, using it, you probably end up using Google Cloud in the end, but uh, it's still a possibility to build your own cloud as well. And uh, uh, Chromium is uh, the open source project that basically shares the source code of uh, Google Chrome. And again, as uh, with EA WebKit, you can use it to, um, to build the UI of the game as a web page. And uh, the interesting thing here is that you can actually combine different stacks to achieve different things. So if you, for example, use Chromium in your game, you can benefit from the whole main stack meaning that you can have a MongoDB database. If you want, you can go crazy and even use serverless architecture and uh, benefit from all that just from uh, the uh, Chromium that you've integrated. And if we go back to our game dev stack, we'll see that we actually have all the things that we need to uh, create the game. We have the 2D tools, the 3D, the sound. We have multiple great options for uh, game engines. And we have uh, quite a few uh, as middleware as well. So everything is completely free, open source, and you can use it to create awesome games. And actually, uh, let's just see a few games that are open source and how they look. This is Zero uh, AD, which is a strategy game, very similar to probably. It's a custom engine. Uh, well, yeah. But uh, the thing is that the game itself is open source, and some of the, uh, the assets and some of the things that are used in uh, these games are not open source, but the games themselves are open source and show how open source software can be used. This is Hedge Wars. It's a port, uh, clone of uh, Worms. It's a very fun to game to play. Uh, this is another kind of clone. It's very similar to Super Mario Kart. Dark mode is actually uh, very similar to Thief if you played it. It's a stealth action game. This is for the shooter guys, or so. And yeah, we pretty much uh, saw that uh, there are a ton of uh, tools and uh, technology that we can use to create open source games. We saw some uh, examples of uh, open source games, and here are some takeaways. Uh, basically, you can't go wrong with Blender, GIMP, and Inkscape. They're very mature editors and uh, provide very 
nice environment to create content for your games. For the game engines themselves, you have a bunch of all, uh, options, but uh, you sh should just uh, choose the one that both suits you and the target platforms that you want to uh, <coughs> target. Uh, and keep an eye on what big studios are sharing because uh, we only saw a few of them, but basically if you just Google GitHub uh, any major game uh, studio, you be probably presently surprised by uh, the amount of things that they have open source. There are profiling tools, there's uh, source controls uh, tools, there are all sorts of things that are um, out there, so just keep an eye on that. And now, if you have any questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, mine is not that much of a question, it is a, a common sort. So, because you did mention GitHub, and, and it's a great place to find code, and uh, yeah. like open source code. Uh, I think you should also, also add this to it, because there's a place to find open source art and open source content. Yes, so, yes. Uh, there are many places like this, but for example, open game art is one. Yeah, yeah. Them. Indeed, uh, it's a great option, but. Um, Probably um, uh, the main focus here was just to uh, discuss how you can create new content and it's true that you can actually use existing one. Yeah, the thing is that this is very simple for a team, but uh, usually uh, people, have, most people when they start, they're not a team, they're a single person. Yeah, of course. So in the a single person cannot do everything. Yeah. Uh, they can use GIMP or, or Blender, they cannot create their assets or they cannot write their code. So. Uh, for for us, for one that's just starting in, in, with game development, uh, having the possibility to acquire assets, for example, of sounds. Yes, or yes, or indeed. Or uh, if you are not that much into the visual part of the uh, things, you you can um, look for a ton of assets available online, both 2D and 3D and sounds. There are a lot of places, as you said, that you can find it if you want to. And it's not just that. If you want to get started with game development, and specifically what is called indie game development, which means that you're independent from many game publishers and big companies, the best thing typically would be to actually find additional people that can uh, complement your skills. So if you're just one guy, it will probably be very hard for you to do all this. So if you feel like uh, you're uh, confident in programming, but you don't have the um, uh, design skills, you, you, you can basically use the indie game communities to find other team members and actually uh, make your life easier and your game better. Well, somebody else? No, uh, well, um, do you have a any personal preferences? I mean, favorite uh, game engine, etc., <laughs> or something like that? Well, mm -hmm. I want to say I have a favorite. I don't want to give any uh, <laughs> false directions to anybody. But as I said, it's, it really depends mm -hmm. on where you feel most uh, comfortable in as an environment. And uh, for different games, that can be different uh, game engines. So, if, if you're building, for example, uh, a mobile game, um, you pretty much uh, are limited to uh, that because you, you, there's some of the engines are much better at mobile than others. For example, Phaser, even though it's a, a web-based uh, game engine, it's mobile first, meaning that if there's something that's not performant in mobile, they'll practically optimize it there, uh, even though it might make uh, desktop uh, versions uh, much slower. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. You, you, you have to uh, basically decide not on uh, what's your favorite, but what's the best for the specific platforms. Okay, so they have different advantages. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Christo.